You go to Mark chapter 4. As you're finding your place in Mark chapter 4, I'll give you a little update on our potential gymnasium that we've talked about for some time and kind of waiting for the uh, behind the scenes thing to take place. I did get some word this week. Uh, we finally heard back from the steel company. Evidently, they're selling plenty of steel and uh, got plenty of business. Um, but they finally got back with us, and things are, at least that starts the ball rolling so we can start permitting and uh, get the stuff in the right people's hands. Um, the price actually came in a little better. I think maybe building slowed down a little bit, but uh, that's unusual. <laughs> when you wait, usually it goes up. So it was down a little bit, a little bit better. And so just throwing that out, that we are behind the scenes working on some things, and as uh, soon as that permitting and all of that comes together, of course, we'll start clearing property and start working on that. And ultimately, that will, uh, we've already felt a little bit of the pinch of the Sunday school space. Um, we've got some things we, we might could shift around a little bit for Sunday school, and that would allow us to do some different things with classrooms over in what is now the fellowship hall, and of course, give us a large fellowship hall there in the gymnasium, so uh, it will help us shift some things around. And um, the youth room, of course, uh, that will become the place where the youth will meet and give them some opportunities, some abilities over there as well. So. We're looking forward to getting that move forward if the Lord tarries. And, of course, like I say, if we're in the midst of this and he comes, the Jehovah's Witness can use it and maybe get some <laughs> benefit out of it. So, all right. All right. We're going to read a text here in just a moment, and let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity tonight to look at your word. Pray that your word would uh, challenge our hearts and that you would meet with us, Lord, as we uh, look at your word, that we'd not just approach it academically, but that we might be helped that we might draw closer to you, that certainly the Lord Jesus will be magnified. Lord, we need you to work, and we need you to teach us and instruct us, and we'll trust you to do just that in Jesus' name. Amen. In Mark chapter 4, in a familiar, really, section of the Gospels, Jesus now has introduced this parable. And, of course, he's just beginning his ministry in a sense. I mean, he's had the Sermon on the Mount, and he's been teaching things, but he now it's evident that the Jews are not listening to him. The, the powers that be, the uh, Pharisees, those that are in charge of the Jewish um, government and so forth, they're really just rejecting what he has to say because he does not put his stamp of approval upon their form of religion. He comes in and says, I am the light of the world. Well, they reject what he has to say, so he gives this parable about a sower who goes out to sow some seeds. And of course, he just talks about the four different types of uh, ground that the seed falls on. So if you look down in chapter 4, as he's given this parable, and he says in verse 9, he said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. When he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked him of the parable. And he said, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom, or the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to them that are without, all these things are done in parables. That is, those of you that are without, those that have rejected Christ, that didn't want to hear what he had to say, the Pharisees, the ones that listened and said, we're not interested, uh, we're going to just keep running things like they were, we've heard what he had to say, he's preached, and we're just not going to do it. He said, those are without. On the other hand, you, the remnant, the faithful, those that believe I am the Son of God, those that believe the things that I have to say, you also are going to benefit. He said, it's going to accomplish two purposes. He says in verse 12, that seeing they may see and not perceive. Hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. Now, really what Jesus is saying is that these people had shut their door of opportunity, that God had reached out and they hadn't regarded. He had stretched forth his hand and they wouldn't listen. And he says, now, as Proverbs 1 says, they're going to eat the fruit of their own way. They'd been often reproved and they'd hardened at their neck. Now, as an uh, individual, any one of those individuals perhaps could have stopped and says, what am I doing? Nicodemus was part of this crowd, for instance. They could have individually said, wait a minute, I've gone too far. There's still hope. But he's saying they have turned, and so I'm going to speak to them in parables. Now, he, of course, lays out this parable that you're probably familiar with, and we're going to deal a little bit with, with the seeds here. But think about, if you would, the power of what Jesus is saying. He's dealing here with people's response to the Word of God. How are they going to respond? 
I remember being on a plane one time, flying back to Charleston. And, you know, sometimes uh, you've got a guy next to you, and they're talkative. You get a chance, you might talk to them about the Lord. Some people, you know, they're just totally interested in sleeping. Usually me, that's what I usually do. Or they're reading a magazine or whatever. So sometimes you get a chance to talk to people, sometimes you don't. But this guy was sort of chatty and talkative. And, of course, if they're going to talk to me, I'll let them share their subject for a few minutes. And I'll say, let me share my subject. Well, this guy was willing to listen. I shared the gospel with him. He asked a few questions about it. Uh, he lived somewhere in Charleston here, too. He's flying back, and he asked a few questions. I explained to him, and he actually gave me the opportunity. I laid out, in a, in a brief sense, the, the whole gospel. You're a sinner. Christ died for your sin. You personally have to receive him. There's a heaven to gain, a hell to shun. Went through the whole thing, and he asked a couple of questions about that and said, well, actually, and I don't remember his exact words, but actually, in my opinion, I think that's really an unreasonable position. You know, I think that, you know, there's a lot of different religions out there. You know, the typical argument, um, uh, there's many different roads to heaven, and, of course, God considers where everybody is in their life some type of fluff that he came up with, and I was courteous. We agreed to disagree. Of course, it made no progress. Essentially, he said, I'm smarter than God in the Bible. But uh, that was his response. Now, he obviously heard the word, but he did not outwardly respond. His heart was not prepared. He, who knows what his background was, don't know what he had heard before, but he clearly, it was evident, he did have, not have an openness as far as receiving the gospel. There's other people that I have, and you've seen it happen as well, unexpectedly, uh, you get a chance to speak to them, and, and maybe the opportunity came, and you didn't even know it was coming, and you begin to explain the gospel, and it's evident. You see it in their face. They become very contrite. They, they're very interested, and I, I mean, even to the point of, of moving emotionally, to, uh, that is exactly what I need, and then they come to Christ, and they're saved. What's the difference? The difference is the preparation of the heart. Now, does that mean that the fellow who sat beside me the first time will never be prepared? No, he might, something God may prepare his heart. Uh, the other person, who knows what they've been through, what type of preparation took place ahead of time, who was praying for him, who knows, but we know that people do respond differently. I mean, we need not be discouraged. The Son of God himself, not everybody listened to what he had to say. And yet, what he said was authoritative. What he said was the final word on the subject and yet everybody didn't go along. I mean, do you see Pilate, who has the Son of God up here, showing him to the multitude? And of course, he'd like to let him go. Uh, he sends him over to Herod. Herod just wants to see some miracle. And uh, I don't know, I'll just send him back to Pilate. Do you know Herod and Pilate thought they were in charge? The person they were sending back and forth was really in charge. I mean, he said, whom should I release unto you? They understand this was the God of heaven. He could have released himself. This, this word that we preach, this book that we have, this is God's word, and God is the one that can send it forth. So you'll notice that he says here, that he, as he gives this parable, that he starts off in verse 3, he says, hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. Now he's using the illustration here. I don't know, potentially, they could have been sitting there uh, listening to Jesus, and most of his sermons were outside, and so he's preaching to this crowd and maybe off in the distance, there's a, a person who had some land. This could happen all over the place. And it might have been the time of sowing the seed. And he had his bag there, and he's just walking down. And this stuff's flying in the wind, a big old wheat field. He could have just been sowing this thing along. And Jesus said, behold, a sower went forth to sow. And he explained something about that seed. Well, everybody knew how it worked. When you sowed the seed, there was obviously a plowed area that you were trying to sow to. But inevitably, when they sowed the seed, it wasn't like sticking peas. You know, I knew what that was, did you? No, they were throwing it up in the air like that, and it was blowing. Some of it would go on good ground. But some of it, obviously, the wind's going to blow over to the treaded path. Now, it wasn't a tractor path, but I guess the oxen path was all padded out hard. Some seed was going to lay there. Now, it wasn't going to grab no dampness, no way it was going to take and so the birds of the air would come and eat the seed, and it wasn't going to take root. Well, then, of course, it might be that the particular type of ground they had, as he mentioned, was stony ground. There's a lot of that over in the Holy Land. Now, I'm sure some of the farmers had had to deal with it. Well, I've got some of my field I can plant well, but if I tried to plant it over there, there's just enough dirt in between the rocks 
that it'll just barely take root and the sun will just melt it away. You can't get any water on it. It's not going to make it. And then, of course, there were areas that were heavily infested with thorns. You know, they used thorns to keep their sheep uh, corralled. Um, they had large, like, fences, fence rows and so forth. Well, if some of it flew over in there and it hit the ground, those thorns couldn't have grown if there wasn't some good ground under there. But it was soaking up all the, uh, the, the nutrients. And, of course, no way it's going to, it's so thick, there's nothing going to grow through that. It wouldn't do more than just turn green and, and go away. And they knew what he was talking about. But then, what did a lot of it do? A lot of it fell in the right place and produced fruit. Now, of course, the disciples are listening. And we see the obvious, uh, because we're familiar with what Jesus taught, we see, well, I know where you're going with this. They're totally like, what's this have to do with the kingdom of God? How in the world does this pertain? This makes no sense to us. And Jesus said, that's why I told it to you that way. He said, because the sower went forth to give the seed. Now, think about what he says. He, he tells us over in uh, verse 15, or 14, the sower soweth the word. We know that the seed is the word of God. Now, that seed, how significant is that seed? You know, first of all, the seed is so powerful that he basically is saying in verse 12, he's saying, those that have rejected me, if I didn't tell them in parables, the word is so powerful that it just might turn them around. But they don't deserve to be turned around. They've turned me down, so I'm going to give it in parables. And those who want to know, those who have an open heart and say, I'd like to know more, they're going to get it. But those that reject it are not. Now, what about this seed that we give out? You know the significance is not the sower, but the seed. Now, we give the seed of the Word of God. We spread it. We distribute it. We broadcast it. You know, over in Acts uh, chapter 8, when there was a great persecution, right after Stephen was persecuted, and of course they were just wanting to stay in Jerusalem, and the persecution was so strong that they had to leave, and it says, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere broadcasting, sowing the Word. They went everywhere just scattering it wherever they went. Now that's, God's Word is scattered through His people. Now think about that Word itself. That Word or the sower here that we talk about, is a dedicated sower. I mean, that's their job, right? That's our job. God's entrusted us with the job of sowing the seed. We're supposed to do that, and of course we do that every day. Now, we make concerted efforts as a church to try to reach the community. We try to do that in an organized way. We try to have a visitation. We, Of course, we give an invitation in the service. We try to get people to church. But you know how the church really reaches the world most effectively? is the people that you know, the people that you rub shoulders with, the people that you have connection with, and God himself is the opener of doors, and he gives you opportunity to sow the seed. You say, well, you know, I, I love to sow the seed, and I took a soul winning course, and I know exactly how to go through the Romans road, but I'm just looking for a chance to give that opportunity. That's a great, a great ambition, and the Romans road is a wonderful way to take the scripture and show somebody how to be saved. But what might happen many times before you get to that is you might sow some seed. You see, you may not have five minutes or ten minutes or an, or an ear where a person is going to listen to everything, but I believe the Bible is so powerful that if I can speak a word for Christ, one truth from this book, God can use it. He can use it to wake, awaken their heart and begin to think for them to want to know more because God is obviously more interested in their soul than we are. There's opportunities. Now, again, I don't want to become lazy and say, oh, well, if you know, somebody knocks on my door and asks me how to be saved, I'll tell them. No, every day I could say, God, there's somebody I could probably influence for Jesus today. I don't know how it'll happen, what door you'll open, but boy, I sure love to speak to them about Christ. And God will open doors. So you've got a sower. The sower is significant, but not as significant as the seed. Now that sower goes out, and like Jesus said, in Psalm chapter or Psalm 126, he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again rejoicing. You know, even though the stony ground, the hard ground, and the thorny ground, there's not much fruit. In fact, there's no fruit. Only one fourth of the places that the seed was sown really produces any fruit. Even though that be the case, God is going to produce some fruit. I mean, there is production. Something's going to happen. 
Except the Lord build the house, we labor in vain that build it. God takes his seed and he works. So there's the sower and there's the seed. Now, what about this seed? The seed is the word of God. You know, the thing we can't overlook today is that the seed is a supernatural seed. You know, I'm not spreading a philosophy. If I were spreading a philosophy, a person may just analyze it uh, logically, approach it from an analytical standpoint and say, hmm, I, I have a different philosophy. This is a supernatural message. By the way, if you approach it uh, analytically, you know what conclusion the world comes to according to 1 Corinthians 1? It's foolishness. The foolishness of preaching. I remember watching an interview. Do you remember Donahue? Okay, Donahue was an a old school uh, lower off steroids uh, Oprah Winfrey, okay, uh, way back in, in the day. And it was sort of like the beginning of the talk show type idea. And they had Dr. Bob Jones III on Donahue because of the university was going through these lawsuits and so forth. And, um, and Reagan tried to give them their tax exemption and so forth. So it they, they was, was a political issue, but they had Bob Jones III on there. And I did not see it at the time. I watched it later when I was at school. They had a, a film of it. But I watched him, and, and Donahue, of course, inevitably, it got away from the discussion of the political issue, and they started dealing directly with, you guys are fundamentalists, and you believe the Bible is the Word of God, and, you know, that kind of thing. So people would stand up in the audience. You know, they'd carry the microphone around, and they'd ask questions. So he had an opportunity. The, the, the door opened. A woman stood up, and it was interesting. She stood up, and she said, now, I've, I've been going to church all my life, and you, you just explained what you said. I don't believe I've ever done. How, how do you do that? Well, he took about 60 seconds and explained the gospel. I mean, just clearly, Romans Road, essentially, right down the road and explained it. Now, that was a blessing that he got to do that on television, but Donahue said back to him, and you can go back and look it up, it's probably on YouTube, and he said, you're saying to me that, and essentially he repeated back to him, that we're all sinners, you know, we're basically all sinners, and that Jesus died, and because he died for our sin, that he is the only way to heaven. There's no other way. You've got to have him, and God won't let anybody. And, you know, he said, well, basically, yeah, that's what I said. Well, I think you're being very unfair to God. Well, I don't really watch, care what you think about how unfair it is. God's the one who makes the rules. If God says it's fair, it's fair. I mean, the, the Word of God is not merely just a philosophy. If I try to talk you into it logically, most people think they're smarter than God anyway. I mean, my philosophy is better than yours. It's foolishness to the world. But you say, man, if it's that foolish. I mean, you've got colleges working against us. Uh, propaganda institutions, essentially, is what colleges are. Excuse me. They're propaganda institutions for the most part. I mean, they have been taken over politically. And that's, you know, so you, people are graduating from these places. They become out full of liberal propaganda. And if they don't, it's in spite of the fact. And, and I mean, the world's being taken over from this. What chance do we have? Because we've got a supernatural book. 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. Incorruptible seed. I mean, this book is not just stagnant. It's not just a, a collection of old historical stories from way back. This is the vibrant, living, dynamic, powerful word of God that we share. I mean, this is a powerful book. It's supernatural. It's also sufficient. Do you know the Bible, as old as it is, the, the youngest book, I mean, that was mo written the most recently is the book of Revelation, somewhere around 90 A.D., I mean, that's, that's almost as old as Virgil's Emperor. I mean, that is, I mean, that's old. That's 2,000 years ago. This is an old book. I mean, if a person, I told you, look, I got a book that was written 3,500 years ago to start with, and then I got a collection of 65 more of them, and the last one was written 2,000 years ago, and I'd like you to read this book. I believe it'll be relevant to you. Relevant? It's 2,000 years old. We didn't even have the internet 2,000 years ago. I mean, how could it be relevant to my life? I challenge you to demonstrate that this book is not the most relevant book you've ever read. That's not just preacher rhetoric. I'd stand behind that. This book is relevant. If it's so old and so irrelevant, then why in the world is it so controversial? I mean, I have never known a court case over the law of Hammurabi. 
I mean, I've never heard of had a school that fought said, let's go to the school board. They're trying to tell people about the law of Hammurabi up here. Um, and it's old, but it's irrelevant. Right. It means nothing. Um, the, the, who was it? The Venerable Bede wrote some books way back 1,000, 1,500 years ago. I saw people go, who in the world is that? You're right. You never heard of him because it's, it's irrelevant. If you're a, a literature buff, you might think, oh, yeah, man, that's pretty interesting. I saw that in a museum. I mean, but it's, again, it's, but this book, as old as it is, is sufficient for every spiritual need that ever comes up. Listen, this is a bold statement, but it's true. There's not a single spiritual issue in life that you can find to be addressed that this book does not address. That in itself is remarkable. It's a sufficient book. I mean, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's enough to know right there, isn't it? And is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction, that the man of God may be truly furnished. I mean, it's going to accomplish what it needs to. That's the seed. You know, it's also a significant book. I mean, the seed is significant to the point that it controls the world. Whether the world realizes it or not, this book dictates how things play out. It is a controlling book. Jesus said in John 12, 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. The word that I've spoken unto him, the same shall judge him in the last day. You know what's going to be at the judgment when everybody who's rejected Christ stands before the white throne? The Bible. It'll be there. I mean, it's there as a testimony. This, this, this is not just a passing element that we just have. We've got a book in our hands that is supernatural, sufficient, significant, and of course, it's steadfast. It's never going to pass away. You know, uh, he says in Isaiah 55 and verse 8, my word shall not return unto me void. What a promise. It'll accomplish that which I please and not only accomplish it, prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. You know, I don't have to see everything that God's doing to know he's working. I just know I've got a book, a, a seed that he put in the sower's hand that he's going to do something with. Now we've got the seed, we've got the sower, but I want you to look now as he gets into the specifics, you've got the soil, four different kinds. Now, I'll look down to verse 15. You'll notice what he says about them. So these are by the wayside. He begins to go through them one at a time. These are they by the wayside. That is the ones that did not land on good ground, but went by the wayside that the birds came and ate. He said, when they've heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Just in case something might take root, the devil comes and snatches away the seed. Now, do you believe that the devil actively tries to snatch away the seed? There's no question he does. There's no doubt that the devil is on an active mission to snatch away the seed when it's preached. When I preach a sermon, whether it be tonight, in the morning, uh, whenever the gospel is preached in an evangelistic meeting, whenever a person's even witnessing to someone and giving them the gospel, if the devil even senses there's going to be conviction or there's some even potential for the Bible to go out, he or one of his cohorts is on site. I mean, he's not everywhere like God is, but he's got a pretty good organized uh, host out there that are going to try to hinder. Now, he's not greater than God. He can't stop it, but when it falls on the wrong ground, sometimes the seed can be taken away. Now, you say, well, I thought the word of God never returned void. Well, it didn't. Now, this illustration, it, it, it really goes even deeper if you think about this. Have you ever... Um, seen a pond dug out in the middle of a farm that was just there to feed cows and they just needed some water. Okay, they do that all over the place. But you know, inevitably, if you go fishing in one of those ponds within a few years, they'll be fish in it. They don't have to stock it. Fish get in it. You say, how do they get there? Spontaneous combustion. No, they don't just <laughs> pop up out of nothing. The, the, no doubt what happens is birds. Birds will go into and eat you know, in the ducks and stuff and get little fish eggs on their feet and they'll bring them and they'll drop them and they take them that way. Well, you know, they do that with seeds as well. They'll eat seeds in one place and they'll pass through the bird and he'll deposit them in another place and they'll grow. People will find plants. They'll say, where in the world do those plants come from? Just like the fish get into a pond, these seeds end up in places that are strange places. The bird ate it, took it away from one place, but it ended up somewhere else. 
I remember talking to a, a guy one time. I don't even remember the details. I just remember it impacted me, the story. He found a track in a grocery bag. He got home. Where'd that come from? Found the track. Wonder what this is. Read it. Came to Christ. Uh, one particular time, this has happened probably numerous times, a person walking along, they're all despondent, nothing to live for or whatever, or just curious, and they look in the gutter. There's an old wet, folded up, wrinkled gospel track that somebody said, I don't need that. wonder what that is. How to go to heaven, be 100% sure. Well, I sure would love to know that. And they read it and get saved. And that's happened. Yeah. Now, the seed got taken away by the devil, but it got deposited somewhere else. His word doesn't return void. I'm not telling you every track you've ever given out ends up in a hand that somebody comes to Christ, but I'm telling you his word doesn't return void. Our job is to give it out. So yeah, it falls on the wrong place and the, and the devil comes and snatches it away. I've told you before and you know it's the case. The devil is simply a pawn in God's hand. You know, I believe I'd like to get the gospel over to old Willie Smith over here. And I don't have a good access, so I think I'll just have them witness to uh, John Lewis and let the devil just take it over and get it to Willie Smith. You think God can do that? Amen. God can do that. But you say, why don't he just do it himself? Well, that's not God's program. God chose us. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. He wants to use old weak vessels to accomplish his will. So you have the, so the seed that is basically a barricaded response. I don't want to hear it. Get it away from me. He said that's going to happen. Don't be discouraged. Jesus preached and had the same response. That's your Pharisees. They didn't want to hear it. Now you also have a boasted response in verse 16. So these are they, likewise, the second group, which are sown on the stony ground, who when they've heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. They have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Now, it says they receive the word. That is, they accept the message. I agree with that. That sounds good. I can see some profit in that. But they don't receive the Savior that the word told them about. They're, they're, uh, they're emotionally excited. They see the benefit of it, but there's no depth. They do not actually step in and receive Christ. Now, let me tell you, you wouldn't know this. You'd be excited that they got saved. But in reality, they didn't. You say, man, isn't that terrible? There's people that actually make false professions. Well, there's some people that make no profession, but that doesn't keep us from going after people that really come to Christ. I remember a story of a, a pastor I was with in um, Atlanta, and he re related to me, and he was not criticizing this preacher, he was just relaying the story. This is what happened. He said an evangelist came in. In fact, you wouldn't know his name. It's possibly could have been an old guy. His name was Glenn Shunk. Now, Glenn Shunk was a great evangelist. I mean, he, many people were saved under his ministry. But he said, I had Glenn Shunk come into my church. And his church probably ran a couple hundred. And he said, we had 50 people saved during that meeting. He said it was tremendous. He, I mean, we were just stirred. We were excited. Boy, 50 people saved. He said a year later, not one of those people was still coming to church. He said, I couldn't tell that any of them. He wasn't criticizing the evangelist. He preached the gospel. But he said, literally, of all those 50 people, none of them went on. He said, the next year, I had Bill Hall. I've had Bill Hall here. He wasn't saying he was better than Glenn Shunk. He said, just what happened? He said, he preached the whole week. One man got saved. He said, one decision. I mean, it was okay. We thought, okay, good, good meeting. He was telling me this. It happened 15, 20 years earlier. He said, that man still goes to my church. He got saved. He's a deacon. He's been a deacon on the deacon board for 10 years. Hadn't missed a Sunday since he got saved. I mean, I just radically changed his life. Now, is Bill Hall better than Len Shunk? No. But sometimes people have no depth of earth. Their heart wasn't prepared. They were at the right place. They all sounds excited. Boy, that's good. Let's go. But it just wasn't real. That didn't mean we were preaching the gospel. But on the other hand, this other man, his heart was prepared. He heard God changed his life. Now, Jesus said there's going to be some of that. It's going to take place. He said in verse 18, this third group, these are they such as are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. It chokes the word. 
You know, I look at this from the analogy uh, of the ground. The ground had to be at least acceptable, or the thorns couldn't have grown. The, the, the ground's okay on this one. But the thorns and the, and the hindrances are around it, so the seed falls on good ground. Now, where you stand on this could, I mean, you know, I could, there's room for maybe a disagreement on the application. I think this person could actually represent somebody who got legitimately saved. But the riches of this world, the, the distractions of this world, there's no growth. You know what would happen in this particular case? It wouldn't kill the plant. It just wouldn't be able to flourish. If you cut down those thorns, then it could actually flourish and grow. It just can't do much. It could sit there with the rest of the thorns and, and just kind of flounder, but it wouldn't grow. I wonder if this is not a picture of numerous folks that I've known who genuinely got saved, but they made very little progress in their Christian life because of baggage. They were, the place they lived, it kept them down. The, 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 the surroundings they were still in, even after they got saved, now they should have been better than that. They should have stepped up and walked with God. He's not giving us an excuse but there's a lot of baggage people deal with. And you know, when that baggage is stripped away, I've met people who got saved years before, started to grow and say, you know, I got saved and for a number of years, I made no progress at all. Finally, my life, and they didn't get re-saved, but their life began to flourish. I have a friend who that happened to, he was saved and it was a year later before you'd even known it. Now, I'd love to be able to give a wonderful testimony and say the night that he got saved, boy, he turned down and won five people to Christ and never missed church again. No, he didn't darken the door of a church again for a year. Then he came back and became a preacher and didn't claim he got saved again. He, hey, had just, he had baggage. Perhaps that's what Jesus is talking about here. But then we know there's the final one. These are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, receive it, bring forth fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, some 100 there's good ground. And then you've got the, the blessed response. Here's the issue down in verse 24. He said unto him, take heed what you hear. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. For he that hath to him shall be given. He that hath not from him shall be taken even that which he hath. Now I know even as I read that, in a public setting, your response is, huh? I mean, I get that. But you go back and you understand and study what he's talking about here in context. He's saying, take heed what you hear. How are you going to deal with the truth that you're exposed to? It matters. If you accept the truth that you hear, God will give you more truth. If you turn down the truth, he'll take away even what you already have. You know, if a person's willing to accept whatever truth they've been given, God says, I'm going to make sure you get some more. But what is man's natural response to the truth? Is to turn a deaf ear to it. You know what we need to be able to be effective in reaching people? We never need to overlook this. We got a powerful seed, okay? We got a plan that God's given us. We know it works, and we know the gospel saves. We need some prepared hearts. Hearts need to be prepared. You know, he, uh, back in the Old Testament, Jeremiah, God says, break up your fallow ground, or Hosea, break up your fallow ground. He told them in Jeremiah not to sow them, or to don't sow your seed among the thorns. We need to break up the fallow ground. Personally, I need to break up some fallow ground. God, I want to make sure if you speak to me, I'm open to it. I want to listen. I want to be speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. I mean, even a Christian himself can, the, the principle's still there. The principle is, if I don't like what God had to say, and I say, well, I like some parts of the Bible, but I'm not interested in that, God says, no need to show you anything else. Doesn't mean he takes away your salvation, but you may not grow and make progress because he's brought you to a point, are you going to surrender to this truth? When you do, he may show you more. On the other hand, if you're lost, God's come and confronted you, you're looking for some other way, some way out, you better come right back to where he called you to, you need his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have, he'll give you more. If you have not, he'll take away even that you seem to have. See, the principle of this that Jesus is getting at is what are you going to do with the truth? Whether you're a believer, whether you're lost, how are you going to respond when God gives you truth? Let's go ahead and stop there tonight.